and welcome to the 105. I'm Cooper Patagna, that's 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting, Andrew Ivins. Another crazy week of college football as Georgia gets the big win on the road over number one, Texas. We also had Tennessee smoking cigars over Alabama. Army, Navy are both undefeated. Drew, college football just keeps on spinning. Drew is battling through bronchitis right now. So if, if you hear some coughs, that is wise. But uh, Drew, great to have you back on the show. We got some news before we get to uh, panic or patience with some of the, the biggest blue bloods right now. We got some news about the All-American Bowl, bud. What, what do we got? Exciting. Share it with us. Yeah, the All-American Bowl announcing today. New title game sponsor, America's Navy, taking over for the All-American Bowl. Obviously, Coop, me and you are very familiar with the game. We talk about it all the time on this space. That is the postseason all-star event for the nation's top high school seniors. Uh, this year's roster looks like it's going to be loaded. You name it, top quarterbacks are going to be there. Tavian St. Clair, the Ohio State commit. Deuce Knight, the Auburn commit. But Navy is stepping in, uh, and they're going to have their name on the game. So I'm fired up. San Antonio this year, first week of January. Me and you will be there. The rest of the 24-7 sports team Wall-to-wall -wall coverage and Cooper, the interesting wrinkle. This year, we're going to have some juniors in that All-Star game. So I'm fired up, man. One of the best postseason events. The All-American Bowl does a tremendous job. I know they're happy to have the Navy as a title sponsor. So we'll be looking forward to that. But Drew, like I said, week eight, it wasn't all uh, roses for everybody. There are a lot of programs right now, Drew, that I think are a little bit shaken up, right? In terms of the Blue Bloods, maybe heading in the opposite direction. You can go down the list, USC, Oklahoma, Michigan. We're going to talk about all these schools here. And let's start with the Trojans, Drew. Three and four, one and four in conference play in their first season in the Big Ten. Another very troubling loss on the road to Maryland. They lose this one by one point point drew lincoln riley now 22 and 12 in three seasons in la four and nine in their last 13 games against power four opponents so drew let's play the game panic or patience when it comes to lincoln riley and usc coop i am panicking if i'm a usc supporter if i'm a trojans fan if i'm there in los angeles cooper i think usc is dealing with with a bit of a culture issue, right? And I've had a ton of exposure to the Trojans here the past few weeks. We saw them take on Michigan. We saw them rally against Wisconsin. And then on Saturday, all of a sudden, you find yourself going over to Fox Sports to watch this game uh, against Maryland. And you're wondering, scratching your head, hey, what happened? Cooper, I, I just wonder what that locker room is like. If you look at the starters for USC on the road in College Park, 11 defensive starters, eight of them are transfer prospects. I also don't think we're talking enough about adjusting to this new look Big Ten travel schedule. Three of the losses at Michigan, at Minnesota, and at Maryland going across the country to me. That starts with the head coach getting those guys geared up and ready to go and playing in different time slots, traveling across the country. So I'm panicking right now when it comes to USC and Lincoln and Riley. What about you, Cooper? I'm going to panic, too. And a lot of this has to do with the quarterback position. You look at Lincoln Riley dating back all the way to his time at Oklahoma. You go back and look at the players that he had. He had three years of Caleb Williams between Oklahoma, USC. Guy ends up win winning the Heisman Trophy, the number one pick in the draft. And then before that, Drew, you had guys like Spencer Rattler. He's going to start his third game this upcoming week for the New Orleans Saints. Jalen Hurts, one of the highest paid players at his position in all of the NFL, not to mention guys like uh, Murray and in Mayfield that have come before him uh, as well. So Oklahoma was one of those programs built to the quarterback position. He did an amazing job of stockpiling talent. He has yet to do that here at USC outside of bringing Caleb Williams from Norman, Oklahoma to when he left Oklahoma for the bright lights of LA and Drew. Now you have Miller Moss who respectively I think has played well at times, but he is not those aforementioned names that we've talked about. Behind him, it's Jade Maeva, the transfer from UNLV, who is the guy? Malachi Nelson, one year and done off to Boise State. He's not even starting there. You look at Julian Lewis, currently committed to USC, but there are a lot of rumors that he might end up somewhere else. So there's typically been a lot of pressure put on that quarterback position and the harmony between that quarterback position and Lincoln Riley, Drew. I just don't know if this is the right fit for Lincoln Riley in the Big Ten in L.A. You got a new AD, Jen Cohen, come over, coming over from Washington, Drew. I think there might be more pressure on him to win this year than people think. I wouldn't be surprised here if it doesn't go well down the stretch, if USC is kind of reevaluating and maybe says, hey, we want to go in a different direction. 
Well, I think they look at Oregon also in the Big Ten, how they're recruiting on the defensive side of the ball. You dress everything with the quarterbacks. To me, again, that defense, where is the homegrown talent? Where is the guys that they are pulling from their backyard, from Los Angeles, other parts of California, to spearhead that defensive unit? Yes, new defensive coordinator, new scheme, new system. But to me, still a lot of question marks, and they're relying on a lot of mercenaries there. I just worry about the overall roster construction. I got a lot of guys lured to L.A. because of the the stars and all the lights. But these guys, when it's back against the wall late in the fourth quarter against Maryland, are they going to stand in there and get the stop? That's the big question mark I have with Lincoln Riley and USC. It feels like they need a killer, and they don't have one. Dan Lanning, Oregon, you know, you could say a tough matchup with Ohio State. They get it done at home. We'll see what the rest of the season looks like. They're just kind of missing that umph there at USC. Now let's talk about Lincoln Riley's ex at Oklahoma, Brent Venables. He's struggling too, Drew. You look at Oklahoma, 4-3, and three, now 1-3 and three in conference play. A very tough and very hard game to watch against South Carolina as South Carolina got the win 35-9 to nine on the road in Norman, Drew. You look at Brent Venables. 20 and 13 now in three seasons at Oklahoma Sooners now five and six in their last 11 power four games as well here's a question Drew panic or patient Brent panic or patience with Brent Venables in Oklahoma I'm panicking Cooper and I think this next offensive coordinator hire is going to divine Brent Venables tenure there right if he doesn't get it right and I think this thing is over there in Norman. We can talk about the quarterback situation. We can talk about the offensive line situation. To me, Cooper, the big question mark I have is where are the wide receivers for Oklahoma? I know a lot of these guys are dinged up, but I went back and I looked at the 2024 recruiting class. I look at what they have committed here in 2025. I don't know if there is help on the way for Oklahoma at that wide receiver position. They rank 116th nationally right now in passing yards per game, 122nd in passing efficiency. They're 124th in yards per carry, 114th in rushing yards per game, 128th in third down efficiency. This offense is broken, right? And they keep pulling the strings on these different quarterbacks. I don't know what the answer is. You look at the defense, it has been good enough in certain spots for the Sooners, but they simply just can't score points and for Brent Venables to turn things around right to show everyone there in Norman that he's the guy for this job he has to get the offensive coordinator higher right and to me we haven't seen him do it yet so it's hard to you know not be panicking about the long-term outlook there for Oklahoma. OC Seth Luttrell dismissed yesterday from Brent Venables in Oklahoma. Drew, you mentioned all those stats with Oklahoma's offense. What about their quarterback position as well, right? You look at Jackson Arnold, Michael Hawkins. What happens if both those guys leave the way that they've handled this? You can't blame them. Oklahoma in a tough spot. Drew, I'm going to go panic as well. Oklahoma, they got to get it figured out. You looked at those next five games as well. At Kentucky, Vandy, ULM playing great ball under Brian Vincent right now. Texas A&M and Alabama. This is going to be tough to get to six wins and to be bowl eligible. And if that's the case, Brent Venables, similar to Lincoln Riley, it might be tough going into year four. We'll see what happens there, Drew. Let's talk a little bit about Auburn staying in the SEC. Two and five, 0 oh and four this season in conference. They have not beat a power four team. Uh, their wins coming against New Mexico State and Alabama A&M, excuse me, New Mexico and Alabama A&M. Uh, Drew, this one is tough, especially because you have parts of a team that look better than what they've actually showed. The results are not there. Panic or patience coming off a loss in Columbia against Mizzou for Auburn. <laughs> Well, Coop, that's why I'm going with a patience here right now. I think the silver lining, if you are an Auburn supporter, you're an Auburn fan, is you can look at that roster and you can see the talent that has come through the high school ranks. And you look up right now, Auburn's recruiting class sitting in the top five. Uh, and I think that's going to be the case as long as Hugh Freeze is there. But man, the on-field results just haven't come to fruition. I think Hugh Freeze has to get this quarterback situation right. And I think for a veteran signal caller, that'll likely be available on the transfer portal market. It looks ready to play there on the planes. I mean, you've got a competent defense with, with, with a ton of difference makers. You've got a potential wide receiver one in Cam Coleman. You've got a starting center in Connor Liu. They're going to have to find some offensive tackles. So I'm in a wait and see mode because I think Auburn knows they have to go out and get a veteran quarterback to right the ship. And I think Auburn is going to be as active as anyone 
when it comes to trying to find the next Cam Ward, trying to find the next guy that can step in and turn things around for the school. So I'm, I'm patient right now just because I believe in what is already there on the roster and I believe what's coming in through that high school class. I'm patient as well for all the points you just made, uh, but Hugh Freeze has made this extremely difficult on himself and his staff. This should be a year where you're building towards eight, nine wins. Now year three looks a little bit daunting where you're going to have to win in year three or it's probably another regime change. It doesn't help that Brian Harson had a very similar record through two seasons on the plans. I'm hitting the patience button as well with Auburn. The last one here, Michigan drew now four and three, two and two in conference. They lose to Illinois on the road. You look at Jerome Moore. It's been uh, quarterback uh, musical chairs here. It was Davis Warren, then it was Alex Orgy. Now it's Jack Tuttle. They don't have an answer there. They're one of the worst passing teams in the country. They only have seven plays of over 10 yards or more in the passing game. You're looking at Michigan, the defending national champions, Drew. This one is tough. Then you have Michigan State coming to town. They're playing good ball. Ohio State a little bit later on the schedule. I don't know, Drew. Panic or patience here for Sharon Moore and company. This is a red hot panic for me, Cooper. And you want to know why Michigan player development type of program, but this is a team that just won the college football playoff. I don't think they capitalize enough on the recruiting on the recruiting front. Go back to that 2024 recruiting class, eight prospects inside the top two, four, seven signed with the Wolverines. Cooper, none of those guys have played more than five offensive or defensive snaps this season. That includes quarterback Jaden Davis, who they beat out plenty around the country for the fact that Jaden Davis hasn't been mentioned in this quarterback situation. Hasn't at least been given a, few drives to me is super concerning, especially when you look down the line, what they have committed here in 2025. Carter Smith, a kid out of Florida. I really like him. Reminds me of Max Duggan, but he's a run first quarterback. I just don't know where this vertical passing attack is going to come from the Wolverines. And again, I don't think they capitalize enough on what they did last season when it comes to high school recruiting. Uh, borderline incompetence the way that they handled this quarterback situation going into the year that says a lot about Sharon Moore I don't know how you go into the season the way that they did on top of it Drew you look at defensively Mason Graham gone Kenneth Grant gone Will Johnson gone talking about three first round draft picks all gone out of there throwing Colson Loveland on offense Khalil Mullings Donovan Edwards potentially a couple starters on the offensive line that is a lot of guys that you have to replace for Michigan I don't have a lot of confidence I'm hitting the panic button as well if I'm a Michigan fan they have not loss or excuse me one less than five games you have to go all the way back to 2014 Brady Hoke's last season if that's a guy you're being compared to if you're Sharon Moore that's not very good guys stick around with us right here on the 105 we've got freshman flowers coming up next after a big week eight of college football Welcome back to the 105. Time for week eight freshman flowers, Drew. This might as well just be a uh, Florida-themed segment. I mean, you had all the guys going off. DJ Lagway, Jaden Ball. I know you watch a lot of Florida football. Billy Napier all of a sudden steering the ship back around. Big win over Kentucky, 48-20 to 20 in Gainesville. Talk to me about this freshman running back. Jaden Ball running all over the place. Yeah, Coop, he's one of those guys where you kick yourself for not making him a four-star prospect at the buzzer. Jaden Ball, we listed him as an athlete. Some schools liked him as a linebacker. Florida, Arkansas, others wanted him as a running back. Well, he goes out on Saturday night, gets his first start ever uh, in the swamp, runs for five touchdowns. That tied a Florida record for the most touchdowns in a game. Did it uh, match Trey Burton and a guy named Tim Tebow? Jaden Ball named the 24-7 Sports True Freshman of the Week by Chris Hummer. Carried the ball 22 times for 106 yards in the 48-20 win over Kentucky. Pro Football Focus had him 50 yards after contact. Cooper, I think this guy is the running back of the future there in Gainesville. He was excellent all spring. He can run between the tackles, and he's got some bursts when he gets to that second level. Great evaluation by Billy Napier, right? Everyone pokes, uh, pokes fun at him for that army of staffers he has. Well, guess what? At the buzzer, they went and got Jaden Ball. That's a senior evaluation. Pays off in a big way for the Gators in a huge win over the Wildcats. I'll tell you what, that's pretty good company to be in if you're a Florida Gator, especially if you're a freshman. You got Tim Tebow, uh, Trey Burton, the other guy, Jaden Ball, five touchdowns on Saturday night. Great way to start his career. Drew, I'm going to go with DJ Lagway, a more familiar name, getting his second career start. 7 of 14 passing. That doesn't get you too excited. Only completed 50% of his passes. 
But the ones that he did complete, Drew, he went for 259 yards through the air. He added another 46 on the ground. He was our number one quarterback in 2024 for a reason, Drew. He looks ahead of schedule. I don't know what your takeaways are from this game, but some of the throws that he were ma- he was making, uh, especially in the deep part of the field, he had one where he layered one over two defenders. He's got it all, man, and I just love the poise that he plays with. He's going to have to clean up maybe some decision making, um, you know, especially in the short to intermediate intermediate part of the field. Just learning the speed of the game, especially playing in the SEC. But Florida has their guy here. I think that's what we're excited about. Graham Mertz, unfortunately, goes down with an injury for the rest of the season. I'm really, really excited about the prospect of DJ Lagway, Drew, because if you look at Florida, Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, Florida State, yes, it's a gauntlet. But for DJ Lagway, Billy Napier, that's invaluable experience. Yeah, and I think he can get them to a bowl game, right? You would assume they're going to be favored against Florida State rivalry game. Who knows? All they have to do is just jump up and upset someone. And Cooper, they almost beat Tennessee the week prior. You said it with DJ Lagway. He does look to be uh, ahead of schedule. What was our player comp for him? What was on the 24-7 sports profile? It was Anthony Richardson, former Florida Gator quarterback. That was a first-round pick. If you went and you watched Anthony Richardson's second start and you compared it to what DJ Lagway did in the swamp against a Kentucky defense, which probably has five future NFL guys in that front seven, including Deion Walker. He looked to be in complete command. You said it, yes, there are some misfires here and there, but man, he is a guy that just has the intangibles. He can create and he can make big plays. He tossed one pass 50 yards through the air, Cooper. He was celebrating before the wide receiver even came down with it. I think if you're Billy Napier, you have to be fired up. This looks like the quarterback of the future, like we thought he was. Great performance from DJ Lagway. And there's a reason why we ranked him as high as we did. All right, who you got next? This one was kind of interesting when you texted me on, uh, I think, Saturday night. I hadn't heard this name. Who you got here? Yeah, I'm going to go with Duke. True freshman defensive lineman Preston Watson. On Friday night, Duke took down Florida State for the first time. Preston Watson in the fourth quarter with a key fumble recovery for the Blue Devils. I watch his mother every night on the news, Fox 35, Orlando, Luann Sorrell, have to give her a shout out. Um, Preston Watson, a guy, high three-star prospect for us, but when he signed with Duke, Manny Diaz, his staff came in, talking with some of the guys there in the buildings, they were fired up about this kid. He played 13 snaps, best run defense grade of the season for him, according to the folks at Pro Football Focus. So got to give a salute to uh, Central Florida and Orlando. Preston Watson, certainly someone they're excited there uh, at Duke, and he's going to be a key part of that program here moving forward. Love the, love the shout out of the local news reporter. That's what we're all about here. All right, Drew, speaking of shout outs, let's go with TJ Moore. We've been talking about this guy all season. We said the second half of the season, that's where we're going to see TJ Moore really break out for Clemson. He did a little bit of that. All right. Four receptions, 68 yards and a touchdown and Clemson's 48 to 31 victory over UVA. Drew, they're starting to get him going along with guys like Brian Wesco. I'm excited about this kid. Have one of those TDs called back. I mean, he is a dynamic guy. I think future number one receiver for Clemson, Garrett Riley, Cade Club, Nick Dabo Sweeney, the whole gang there. Uh, But what we've seen in the second part of the season so far from TJ Moore, Drew, I think gives us a little bit more and more confidence about putting that fifth star on him after the performance that he had at the All-American Bowl in San Antonio. Yeah, Coop, I mean, it's the year of the wide receiver. Jeremiah Smith, Ryan Williams. How about Nick Marsh over the weekend in Michigan State's upset of Iowa? Eight catches, 113 yards. He was another guy we were super high on. You're right with TJ Moore. I keep going back to those all-star games at the end of the last cycle. We saw all of these elite pass catchers in Orlando at the Under Armour game. We saw them all in San Antonio at the now Navy All-American Bowl. Uh, TJ Moore, a guy we fell in love with. So when the early returns from Dabo Sweeney We're coming in about Brian Wesco. We said, just wait until TJ Moore gets his footing. We're seeing that now. Uh, Super fired up for his future there in Death Valley. All right, a couple other guys we want to mention. C.J. Bailey, NC State. uh, Drew, obviously starting in place for the injured Grayson McCall on the road at Cal. 
threw for 306 yards, two touchdowns, one point win, uh, and one that NC State Dave Doran needed. Uh, Caden Durham Drew seems like a guy that just uh, is a regular here in the top freshman performers every week became the first LSU freshman to rush for more than 100 yards and scored three touchdowns against an SEC opponent in program history. I mean, you think about all the backs LSU has had coming out, Drew. You add a guy like Harlan Berry, the number one running back in 2025 to the fold. LSU, Brian Kelly, they got it going. Don't look now. Uh, but, Drew, maybe quick takeaways on, on C.J. Bailey. I know this was another guy. I hate to bring it up. We went back and forth on, do we put a four-star on? Do we leave him as a high-rated high, high three-star? What do you think here? I think it's starting to click for him. Huge win on the road. NC State's got to go all the way across the country, eke it out 24-23. We said we were liked him a lot. You know, the early returns coming out of Raleigh, hey, this is a freak. This is a guy that we think could be the quarterback for us at some point down the line. I think it's starting to click. He's a guy who won a ton of games, not only in high school, but on the youth parks. That's a big one. Hey, Coop, one more freshman that we didn't have on there. How about Chris Cole, true freshman, five-star linebacker for Georgia, played over 20 defensive snaps on the road at Texas. He's a guy that we thought it was going to take some time, but it's that is a very encouraging uh, nugget that he got that much run. These freshmen, they're popping up everywhere. And speaking of, we had a 2025 Top 247 update last week. After the break, we're going to look at which guys from that update could be the best day one impact players on Saturdays. Stick around. Welcome back to the 105. Time to take a look at uh, what potential seniors in high school could impact your favorite program next year, Drew. It was a heavy top 247 update for the 2025 class in the middle of October. A lot of film pouring through. What do we have? Five new five stars, 40 newcomers to the top 247 as well. Not to mention a lot of guys uh, being added to the top 247. A lot of four stars being taken away. Just part of the process. No harm, no foul. Uh, But Drew, let's talk about some of the players that could make a day one impact next year. And we had a little bit of a rule here, right? We said we could only choose one five-star. We could uh, pick three players each. I'm going to start with Jonah Williams. And I told you before we went to break, I said, Drew, I think I have the perfect player comp. We have been struggling to find this one. I'm going to go with a combination, okay, of Sonny Styles and Malachi Starks. And if you know anything about Sonny Styles, he is a big joker at Ohio State. And Malachi Starks, one of the best cover safeties uh, in all the country as well at Georgia. And Jonah Williams, a kid that we love, we have ranked inside the top 10. He's the number one safety in the country. Therefore, he is my five star that I expect to make an immediate impact, Drew. Dual sport athlete, baseball background. We talked all about that. The first touch of this season for Jonah Williams, he housed a kickoff uh, of 95 plus yards so he is a dynamic player that can do a lot of different things drew i think he's going to end up playing closer to the line of scrimmage but the more you watch him the more you're like this guy can really do anything i mean if you put him on an island play man to man he can do that if you put him in the deep third he can do that uh he is a true life Swiss Army knife, and I'm really, really looking forward to Texas and Pete Kwiatkowski and how they're going to use this kid. It's just one of those guys you don't overthink it, and you're like, he's just too good, too athletic not to see the field early. Coop, I watched a lot of football on Saturday, right? I was uh, hamstringed to the couch. <laughs> and one of my takeaways on Saturday night watching Texas versus Georgia was – Okay, I could see Jonah Williams, that body type, being somewhere on either one of these teams' defenses, right? Kind of blurring the positional lines, both units, Texas and Georgia. I mean, they have freak athletes back there. Jonah Williams, my number one freak. I I think this is an excellent selection, Cooper. Uh, With the five stars, it would have been easy to name, hey, maybe Bryce Underwood, maybe some of these wide receivers. Uh, But no, I do think Jonah is just so unique. And the fact that your player comparison, you are kind of like, hey, let's choose different all SEC caliber talents, all big talents, and put them together. That says just how unique of an individual he is. I love that one, Cooper. Uh, My five star, I'm going to go to the offensive line. And I know you wrote a story about this for 24-7 sports. We got a ton of offensive tackles at the top of the board. How about the number one ranked offensive tackle, David Sanders, headed to Tennessee. This is a guy that we have been high on for three years now, debuted in these rankings as our number one ranked prospect. Cooper, I find this stat very interesting. Since Josh Heupel arrived at Tennessee, 
the Vols have yet to start an offensive lineman that that staff has signed out of high school. I think David Sanders could buck the trend. Now, is he ready to go year one in the SEC? A quick look at that body. He's on the lighter side. Would say probably not. But David Sanders, if they can get him in to a developmental strength program and get that body right and improve the play strength, I think there's a chance he could be the Vols' potential right tackle opposite of Lance Hurd in 2025. Remember, they're going to lose John Campbell to graduation. Someone's going to have to step in. Tennessee's likely going to be in the transfer portal. But given what they have invested in David Sanders and his recruitment, I think they could throw him out there very early. Coop, I was also thinking about this. You know, Josiah Thompson, South Carolina starting left tackle, a borderline five-star prospect for us last cycle. I think he's kind of similar to David Sanders in, in a lot of different ways, right? Both very lean, lanky guys that can recover and react. I think David Sanders is ahead of Josiah Thompson just based on where they were this time last year. So I think David Sanders, to me, I think we're going to be talking about him a lot come August uh, in advance of the 2025 season. I think from a disposition, from a uh, technicality standpoint, not technicality, maybe technical standpoint, David Sanders is ahead of somebody like Josiah Thompson. As you mentioned, I think the biggest the biggest drawback on David Sanders is getting the frame get there, right? He's hovering around 285, 290. You mentioned him getting there early, putting that body armor on, getting ready for SEC football is going to be important. The thing we love about David Sanders, Drew, and you know this, obviously uh, covering him for as long as you have. I love the two-way snaps, even as a senior. Sometimes you don't see that all the way through. This guy loves football. It shows up on tape. I think he is further ahead. I do think he can play early. We'll see what happens. And I actually think right tackle is a good way to kind of uh, usher him in to start his career, not put him on the blind side of Nico Iamaliava. All right, let's talk about uh, a Clemson Tiger, Drew. I had to pick between Braden Jacobs and this kid, Tay Harris. And Tay Harris, Drew, I think has slowly become one of our favorite players of the, of the 24 seven sports scouting staff. And this guy five, nine, three quarters, almost 185 pounds. But I mean, talk about pure football player. He also runs four, three, eight, ran 10, six in the hundred. He's 10, five in the broad jump. So he is a mighty mouse explosive player and he is a football player every ounce of him and and, and from what he does it at cedar town in georgia from the offensive side of the football to the defensive side of the football to the way he key and diagnoses in the run game uh to the way he's so active playing the deep part of the field as well this is just going to be one of those dudes drew he adds too much value even if it's on special teams where i think dabo sweeney who loves playing freshman by the way Tay Harris is one of those guys you can circle right now. Just I, I don't know if he's going to be in the starting lineup, but you know he's going to be in the two deep. He's a dude, man, and he's a football player. And I I'm I might be reaching here. I got to go back and I got to go through the YouTube archives. But I'm like, who's another like sub five ten safety that is just all over the place? And there there are a handful of them, right? You can go Buda Baker. You can go guys like Ugo Amadi. But man. Um, who, who was the one? Uh, Bob Sanders, Indianapolis, the, the guy that's probably a Hall of Famer, right? Uh, that kind of comes up. I mean, that's the type of player this dude is. So super stoked about him. I know you love him as well. I probably stole him from you if I had to guess. It's a great pick, Cooper, because Dabo does play his young guys. He does play the freshman. And I think when you look at Tay Harris, right, first line of my scouting report on him is going to be lunch pail type of football player, right? Just a hard-nosed individual, clocks in, clocks out, does it like you said in all three phases. He'll come up and smack someone. I think what really sold me is we're talking about a kid from Atlanta, went down to South Florida this past spring on the off-season camp circuit, and he shut down a loaded group of wide receivers out of Broward in Miami-Dade County. He was excellent during one-on-ones. It was one of the top uh, performances I had seen in that type of setting. He's also going to run track for Clemson. The Tigers uh, are going to allow him to do that. But guys haven't done that there for that program since like C.J. Spiller uh, a, d- a decade ago. So I love that pick, Cooper. Uh, I think we're going to see him on the field, and this might be a little spicy, Um, Not really a breakthrough true freshman safety here in 2024, but I think he could have a K.J. Bolden-like impact uh, like we saw his first year at Alabama. He has that type of chance to make that type of impact. Different different players, different body types, but he's going to be the guy that's going to be in the lineup. Coop, I'm going to stay or I'm going to go over to the SEC, a name you just mentioned a little bit ago, Harlan Berry, our number one ranked running back. 
headed to LSU. Yeah, Caden Durham, he has been excellent. He has been awesome. That is the bell cow for the Tigers. I'm talking about the true freshman. But Harlan Berry, man, he reminds me uh, of Shady McCoy just in terms of how creative he is at the second level. We're talking about a kid that was the fastest man at Under Armour's Future 50 event two years ago, went 4.39 in the 40-yard dash. LSU is going to score some points. Uh, we're seeing it this year after Jaden Daniels leaves. They got Bryce Underwood, our number one ranked quarterback coming in. I think Harlan Berry, you can pair him with Caden Durham, ride the hot hand. They complement each other very well. So Harlan Berry, to me, I think he's certainly someone to know moving forward. And I think he has three down capabilities in terms of his ability to catch the football out of the backfield. Haven't talked about him enough just in what it means for LSU moving forward, especially with the emergence of Caden Durham. I love that pick. Yeah. And you throw in Caden Durham, Josh Williams, probably out of there after this season, definitely out of there after this season, that running back room. It used to be a little bit of a concern for LSU. Now all of a sudden a strength. We'll see what happens with Caleb Jackson as well. Somebody they were super high on coming in in the season. He had in Harlem Berry. They have not had a skill set like Harlem Berry in quite some time. I think you have to probably go back to Clyde, Clyde Edwards, E. Lair, who ended up being a first round draft pick of the Kansas City Chiefs. I love what he can bring you as a receiver out of the backfield as well. So big fan of that one, uh, Drew. I know you're going to like this one. How about Mason Posa committed to Wisconsin, the linebacker edge, whatever you want to call him, top 170 player for us. And you talk to some people around Wisconsin, and they love this kid. Luke Fickle is a wrestler. This kid is a wrestler, state champion wrestler. You can play him off the edge. You can play him as an off-ball linebacker. He is tenacious. Uh, Drew, all three of these guys that I've mentioned, they're all football players. So when I say all, all football players, that is the biggest compliment that I could give you. That means they're tough, they're instinctual, they're dependable. That's exactly what Mesa, Mason Posa is. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Nick Herbig, a little bit bigger, uh, carries a little bit more weight. You can play him in a 3-4 defense as an inside backer. I like his pass rushing ability off the edge. I think that's ultimately where he ends up, is closer to the line of scrimmage. Drew, Wisconsin, I know you had some doubts a little bit earlier in the season. They got it going. Uh, they got a matchup coming up, I think, this week against Penn State. Um, but, man, Luke Fickle, uh, we know this team is very, very crafty when it comes to talent identification evaluation. If there is one player in this class that you had to pick to define Wisconsin, it would be Mason Posa. Yeah, Coop, I wrote about it in the talent tracker on CBS Sports. All right, when is uh, Wisconsin going to have something to hang their hat on? And guess what, Cooper? They are now playing the young freshmen, the young second-year players, and uh, they are winning some games. So, yeah, uh, maybe Luke Fickle was reading CBSSports.com. Coop, I'm going to finish up here with another running back. I know I'm kind of cheating here. Running back's very easy for them to play as true freshmen. But how about G Gideon Davidson? Headed to Clemson, our number three ranked running back, Coop, was hearing some chatter that some other schools are trying to pry this kid away from the Tigers. Hey, Phil Moffa is no longer going to be at Clemson in 2025. I know they got some other running backs in the staple, but having had a chance to study Gideon Davidson here as a senior, I just love this what this kid brings to the table, the combination of the strength, the play speed, the vision. Uh, he likes to hurdle people. Cooper through five games. He's got 14 rushing touchdowns. Here's what really stands out to me. Two kickoff return touchdowns. He also plays some linebacker. He was the Max Preps National Junior Player of the Year, averaging close to 12 yards per carry. Everything you read about Gideon Davidson, we're going to get him at Navy's. Uh, the Navy All-American Bowl in San Antonio. This kid is wired the right way. He fits the culture there at Clemson. I just think someone, he is someone that can step in, uh, and it might be a slow burn at the beginning, but they can get him more and more involved in that offense. Again, Phil Moff is gone. Cade Klubnick, he could be back. I think Gideon Davidson, a name to know. And if, hey, if you're playing you know, uh, fantasy football for colleges, got a dynasty, I would tuck him away because we know Clemson will ride the hot hand. They will find a, a workhorse of a running back. I think it could be Gideon Davidson at some point down the line. Yeah, you got Marquise Davis in there as well, committed to Clemson, another top 247 running back. Clemson getting it done. Drew, you know they're going to play these freshmen. Dabo Sweeney, um, whether or not he said it verbally, has been somewhat defiant to use the transfer portal. That's fine, but you got to go out and get guys like that. We, you know, we got two guys on this list that we talked about, the running back, and then Tate Harris as well. You throw in Braden Jacobs, Drew. There is a lot of pieces from this Clemson class that we like a lot. Guys, stick around. We got the transaction wire still busy, believe it or not, in the midst of all this college football chaos. Stick around after the break.
Welcome back to the 105 Recruiting Never Sleeps, and that's why we have this show. Uh, but it never sleeps for Kirby Smart, Drew, even when you're beaten up on Texas in their own house. How about five-star defensive lineman Elijah Griffin? He commits to Georgia. The Dogs now up to number three in the 24-7 sports composite team rankings, Drew. The number four player in the country, the number one defensive lineman, and another day in Athens for Kirby Smart in the gang. Uh Drew, we struggled to find a player comp for this kid. I think we ended up with Quinnen Williams. We threw out names like Jalen Carter. Speaking of Jalen Carter, it's been a long time, not that long, but in, in Georgia years, it's been a long time since Georgia ha has had a Jalen Carter or Jordan Davis. It seems like they got their guy here in Elijah Griffin. Yeah, Coop, my big takeaway, top four commits for Georgia right now. You said it, this recruiting class ranks number three nationally. The top four commits, all front seven guys, Elijah Griffin, Isaiah Gibson, Zayden Walker, Darren Akinabong, still in play, Justice Terry, one of the nation's top unranked uh, prospects, Chase Litton, a major riser for us in the most recent rankings update, Kevin Wynn, who's committed to Florida State, and then Christian Ingram, who is a late bloomer. We talked all last cycle about Georgia, what they have had done on the offensive line, the Great Wall of Athens. They took all this mass uh, and they and they locked that up. Well, guess what they're doing here in 2025? They are reloading on the defensive line, and you saw it. What that can what that can do in a game Saturday night against Texas. I mean, Michael Williams, man, they had him back in action. Uh, Longhorns couldn't protect him. And the, the the big takeaway, Elijah Griffin, another one of these game changers that's coming in uh, for the Bulldogs. Huge pickup for them. I want to see, can they challenge for that number one spot? I don't think that's out of the question, Coop. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they, they got some meat left on the bone. J even if you're thinking about their front seven, what they could possibly add with those names that you talked about, Drew. How about Jalen Walker? Shout out to the boys here. All right. The only five star uh, ranking that Jalen Walker had right here at 24 seven sports. He played out of his mind along with Michael Williams, Georgia. They're always going to get it done at the point of attack. Drew, some good. Some not so good for Georgia as well. 2026, Drew, Jared Curtis, one of the top quarterbacks in the country, decommits from the Bulldogs. He has a top 10 ranking, the number three quarterback in the country. Other hats on the table, according to our friend Tom Loy, Oregon, Alabama, South Carolina, Ohio State, and Auburn. Drew, there is some whispers that Jared Curtis could reclassify, even though I think as of lately, those have gone away a little bit. But uh, Drew, what do you think here as Jared Curtis enters back into the free market? Well, I know you saw him play on Friday night. You were out on the road on the sidelines. So I want your take on him. But out of all those schools you mentioned, the one where I'm kind of like, oh, OK, I, I'm, I'm interested here. How about South Carolina? Right. Uh, Jared Curtis has visited there multiple times. Shane Beamer, Gamecocks are four and three right now. Uh, most of those losses are two ranked opponents. But man, that defense, Sharp College Football, uh, an analytics website, they rank South Carolina with the nation's fourth best pass rush, and they continue to stack chips on that side of the ball. They got to get the offense figured out. I like some of the wide receivers they have committed. We mentioned Josiah Thompson already on this show. Two underclassmen tackles. I think Jared Curtis, to me, wow, if South Carolina can get that done, we're talking about a potential uh, noisemaker in the SEC, given what they have on defense. Coop, I don't know. What, I mean, what do you think about that potential marriage? And what did you think of Jared Curtis when you got to see him uh, under the lights? I like the marriage. Uh, one, he is a physically ready player. You know, he's a big kid. He's a stout kid, a former running back, transitioned really naturally to the quarterback position, can get outside of the pocket as well. Really elite level arm talent. The more I see him, the more I like him. And I really like his demeanor as well, just really kind of getting to meet him and spend some time with him. And in terms of the fit, I like the fit as well. If you're South Carolina, I think you got to go all in on one of these uh, pure passers. And I think that's where South Carolina is right now. They've done a tremendous job on the defensive side side of the ball they're getting better you mentioned guys like Malik Clark as well they're starting to surround this position I think they've liked a little bit what they've seen from Lenore Sellers I think they need more consistency out of that position uh, I think Lenore Sellers would tell you that as well I think that's where they're going with Jared Curtis but I can see if they were going to do a full court press on Jared Curtis why they would do that and I think you kind of stack up with like the Deuce Knights and the and the Matt Zollers of the world uh, pretty well here in 2025 if he did decide to reclassify. Drew, keeping our focus on quarterbacks, what about Clemson? What are they doing, right? Blake Hebert, uh, three-star quarterback that was committed to the Tigers. He flipped to Notre Dame. Drew, what's next for the Tigers? They didn't take a quarterback last year, so it kind of puts them in a, a little bit of an interesting spot here. 
Well, we said this with Notre Dame. This is a position I think a lot of schools wish they could be in, right? You get to evaluate senior seasons. And for Clemson, uh, you throw out that Georgia game. Who has had a more explosive offense than the Tigers with Cade Klubnick back there beating defenses with both his arm and his legs? I think for Dabo Sweeney and the Tigers, this is a very opportunistic position for them. You said it last cycle. They didn't sign a quarterback. They have two committed in 2026, but they need a long-term plan post Kate Klubnick because they're now more than not likely going to take a transfer. I don't know names that come to mind. Bryce Baker, the North Carolina commit local kid out there. Uh, you, you know, you have Cutter Woods, another in-state prospect committed to South Carolina. Do commit Dan Mahan. I just think for Clemson, we have so much questions about Dabo and, and his roster construction. Well, hey, you got six weeks before signing day. You don't have a quarterback committed, uh, but you have one of the nation's top and the most exciting offenses with some good freshman wide receivers. Go get a blue chip quarterback. So I think that's a storyline to follow uh, as we approach December. All right, Drew, we got some news in the transfer portal as well as three-star receiver via the transfer portal. Donovan McCulley via Indiana is set to visit Michigan versus Michigan State. They're probably going to roll out a game plan of how he's going to block on the perimeter. Uh, Drew, honorable mention, all Big Ten selection last season, 2023, 48 catches, 644 yards. I've watched this kid, like this kid, big red zone threat, 6'5", former quarterback, over 200 pounds possession receiver but can go up and get it natural ball skills i actually think this would be a great value add he played in the big 10 this is a big 10 receiver 50 50 ball whether it's Jaden davis or somebody else i think michigan needs these type of body types would understand why they would do that guys stick around the coaching carousels already started as october well it's the new november we'll hit that next here on the 105. Welcome back to the 105. The coaching carousel has officially started October 21st, Drew, and we are here already. Mike Houston out at East Carolina after a three and four start to the season, 27 and 38 in five plus seasons at East Carolina. Will Hall, he's gone at Southern Miss. He was 14 and 30 in four years there. Andy Ludwig, the offensive coordinator at Utah, he's decided to step down after Utah continuing to struggle offensively. Also, Seth Luttrell out at Oklahoma. Drew, already the names are spinning round and round and round. Feels like this is more accelerated than it ever has been. Nature of the beast in college football. Let's start with East Carolina, Drew. Uh, Houston was making $2.4 million. I know you and I talked about it. They had uh, NIL spending uh, north of a million dollars. You hear some of the names, according to Pete Nako said on three, some of the names mentioned here for this job, LSU co-OC, Joe Sloan, Garrett Riley from Clemson, Brian Vinson, head coach of ULM, Tim Banks, DC, Tennessee, Tony Gibson at NC State, Bill Clark, the former head coach of UAB, drew for East Carolina. Those are some high quality names. I don't know how you feel about that, but if they were to reel in any one of those guys, I think I'd be pretty excited. Yeah, Joe Sloan, the name that jumps out to me, friend of the 105 guys. He's been on the program before Cooper. I don't want to put on a 10 foil hat, but man, Joe Sloan were to go to ECU. Does that change anything with Bryce Underwood, the number one ranked quarterback country uh, commit in the in, in the in country I'm, I'm just kidding there no i think ecu is a is a sleeping giant i've covered some games there cooper a ton of uh, fan support alumni support local support that is a region where you can recruit very well a lot of talent in eastern carolina and north carolina in general you can get up into virginia down into georgia we've seen them in florida we're interested to see who gets that job yeah, Joe Sloan, certainly an interesting name, ties to East Carolina, along with Garrett Riley as well. I mean, if you're East Carolina, you're in a pretty prime position here to make the most out of it. You got some names there, obviously guys that haven't been head coaches before, and then names like Bill Clark uh, that enter the picture along with Brian Vinson that could be appetizing as well. Guys, we appreciate you joining us as always right here on the 105. And just a reminder, you can find us every Monday and Wednesday right here Monday on the CBS Sports Network, 2 o'clock Eastern. Wednesday on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel and wherever you find your podcast. We appreciate you guys joining us. For Andrew Ivins, I'm Cooper Patagna. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you next time.